we're going to go ahead and get started here. And let me start actually with a quick announcement. This afternoon's town hall is being broadcast via a webinar. So what we would ask folks to be mindful of is as we go through the updates today, if you have any questions, if you could hold your questions till the end, and we'll have a Q&A session at the very end. Um, with that, on behalf of my co-host Vicki Bradley and myself, um, I'm Brian Smith, the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Finance and Accounting. We welcome you to the first town hall meeting uh, since we went live with uh, PeopleSoft HCM payroll and financials back in October uh, 2014. So welcome today. Hope everybody's having a good summer. Uh, what we'd like to do today is just since it's been um, you know, nine months since we went live and we just passed year end, wanted to take a little bit of a time out just to talk a little bit about or reflect a little bit on where we've been, um, talk a little bit about where we are right now. But I think more importantly, and I think of maybe perhaps of more interest to everybody here and everybody watching via webinar, is where we are going. So with that, we're going to start out with a little bit of history, and I'm going to turn it over to Vicki. All right. Thank you. As Brian said, I'm Vicki Bradley. I'm a senior director in the Office of Human Resources. And I wanted to spend just a second talking about how we got to where we are today. Um, our, we had very, our legacy systems were aging. Our payroll system was put in in 1968, back when Lyndon Johnson was president. I think maybe many of the people in this room weren't even born yet. So um, it has been around for quite a long time. The financial system was put in in 1988. And then um, we did have HRS and EPA web put in um, later on after the internet actually came alive um, in the year 2000 and 2008. So, um, our systems were aging, people who were supporting the systems were retiring and leaving, and we didn't have people with a skill set that could just jump in and, and start working on them. Things were changing, um, things like security were changing rapidly, and we needed people who understood um, how to get our systems um, to evolve the way we needed them to evolve. We didn't have, we couldn't do upgrades the way we needed to do upgrades, we couldn't grow and um, do new things to meet the university's needs. So as we looked at our legacy systems, um, it was just clear that it was time that we needed to change in order to um, keep evolving. So growing with the university, this, you know, when you look at technology, what technology was like back in the days when our systems were designed, and then you look at the kind of technology that we have now, you know, the times have changed dramatically. And look at how, you can talk about times are changing, look at how the way students work, the way they interact, the way, um, the way people study. You know, the times have just changed and we had to make sure that our systems, you know, are keeping up with the pace of the way the world was changing and the way systems were changing. So we really needed to, to get into a platform that would put us in a, in a place where we could continue to grow and evolve and meet the university's changing needs. Yeah, as we kind of look at um, what the university's needs were and, and getting or finding a system that would meet those needs, I think it's important though just to take a little bit of a step back for just a second for a little bit of context and think a little bit about the, the university as a whole. Um, you know, I know on a daily basis, I know we're very focused on, you know, our jobs at hand and what, what's immediately in front of us, but I think it's important to stop for just a second and think about the fact that we were basically finding a system that would integrate, um, for the first time, integrate with the HR system, integrate with the student system. But you step back from that, I mean, on an, that's just the system itself, but you think about the institution and you think about the fact that we are an academic or a teaching enterprise. We also have a substantial research enterprise. We also are a uh, utility operation. We have a police department. We have a parking operation. We have you know, a retail. Um, stores, we've got you know, a variety of other operations on this campus. So first of all, it's a very diverse, um, as, as most of you are well know, this is a very diverse community, a very diverse range of types of business operations within the university community. Um, and just to kind of think a little bit about scale or what we're talking about with the university, when you look at it, most of the folks in here and maybe most of the folks um, online are, you know, have a financial perspective. 
and thinking a little bit about numbers, um, the university, you know, right now does about three billion dollars a year in revenues. We've got a balance sheet with about nine billion dollars in assets. So I say all that to say that, you know, in putting in, putting together a system to kind of integrate everything, it's a very, um, I say, complex, very interconnected, um, and a very large scale enterprise that we're trying to fit all this together in. So I think it's important to do that. And as Vicky mentioned, the systems that we had in place, a 20, you know, 26, 27 year old financial system that we had in place that, you know, given where we are now with the scale um, of our institution, you know, it was really important to um, find something to kind of carry us forward. And obviously, you know, with all that being said, with these different enterprises we have on campus, as everybody well knows, you know, higher education, like a lot of other industries these days, are subject to a lot of change, um, a lot of external pressures. And, you know, we're forced to, on a daily basis, think about how can we identify other opportunities for additional revenues, how is our business model changing. So, again, the financial system and the uh, HR systems have to take into consideration that we are an evolving organic enterprise. Um, and then, obviously, we're in a world today where everybody, you know, first of all, there's a lot of data. And I think everybody has high expectations for uh, data-driven decisions, reporting information, and the like. So again, all the more reason that we needed to put in place a new system to kind of meet the expectations and demands of today. You know, what I'll say real quickly on this is everybody knows change is very difficult. Um, you know, we were in a position where, you know, we needed to make a change because of aging systems, also because of evolving needs. Um, so we had, you know, opportunity in front of us to, to make some changes. Um, it has been, um, you know, it has been difficult. It's been a lot of work for everybody in this room, everybody on the webinar, um, and it has taken a substantial amount of effort on everybody's part to get where we are. And as part of change, obviously, you know, that's, you know, we've been focused for the last, you know, couple years on getting the system in place, um, now operating with the system. Um, and I think today one of the things we want to do is step back and talk about, you know, the vision and kind of where we're going because that's an important element of change as well. All right. Thank you. So one year ago, we had a lot of campus engagement. Um, campus engagement, campus involvement has been very critical to this project for a long time. So it wasn't just, even though we're going to talk about the past year, I do want to say some of our campus involvement went back many years ago. Um, in the middle, we have stakeholders listed there. We had a stakeholder committee, which was um, consisted of representatives from some of the unit, campus units, the schools and divisions, as well as central offices. They started meeting back in the fall of 2009. And um, we've met pretty much twice a month for most months since then. So we've talked about a lot of decisions with, with the heads of HR and finance with different um, schools and divisions. The campus working groups, we've had them going since 2011. We started them. Um, campus working groups consisted of 200 people from across campus that were nominated from the, the um, dean's office or the vice chancellor's office from every school and division. And we had 200 people that we met with from 2011 all the way through to go live. And we reviewed the requirements that were needed for the system design. We reviewed configuration. We showed them demos, showed them how things were going to work, got feedback, um, went through testing. A lot of those folks um, participated in testing with us, too. Um, and then we, they had the specific job or role to come and give us feedback on what we were showing them for all of those years. And then to take that information, we gave them handouts. And it was their role to go back to their school division and say, this is what's happening. How are we supposed to adapt to this? How are we going to change what we're doing in our unit to be able to be prepared when Connect Carolina goes live? So um, then as we got later on, about 2013, March of 2013, we established the role of a tips, tips and trainers. Um, and they were really our training and implementation partners. And we had at least one tip and trainer from every school and division. And um, sometimes we had more than one. And we met with them um, monthly, and we had tasks we would send for over a year. And then on the HR side, we would give them files of data and say, this, doesn't, this data doesn't look right. Please clean it up so we can get it correct in legacy before we bring it over into Connect Carolina. So we met with those folks. Um, 
and they were responsible for kind of getting the training set up and getting their, being the liaison with the Connect Carolina team to make sure that when we went live, we would have a successful experience um, for that school and division. So we had lots of different ways that we were trying to get involved with campus to make sure that campus was ready for us um, and for Connect Carolina when we went live. So a year ago, those of you, I see many familiar faces who came to user group meetings, um, the campus working group meetings, and um, I know there were lots of folks around campus who were highly involved um, at this time last year. Also a year ago, we were right around this time, we were very heavily involved in testing. We had um, over 100 testers and we tested thousands of transactions. So the project team came up with transactions and said, you know, try this, like, let's make sure this works. Um, we got transactions from some of the schools and divisions who had in the various roles we just talked about, where they submitted transactions of things they wanted to make sure worked for them. So we had several rounds of testing that went on from beginning in March of 2014 through July, through user acceptance testing. We were working with some campus testers in addition to the central office testers and the project team testers. So um, all of that was going on, and we had more, more than six months of testing before we went live. Of course, once we went live, you know, even though we tested thousands and thousands of scenarios, when you go live and you have thousands of people out there doing it, there's different combinations of data, different ways of doing things. So as much as we tested, we found, you know, bugs and things that, that weren't working quite, quite right. So we were able to, um, after testing, go in and kind of revise some of our business practices. Another big, um, another big effort that's been associated with Connect Carolina has been the training element. Um, and as probably most of you well know, the beginning last spring, spring of 2014, uh, we started a substantial training effort with Connect Carolina. Um, over that period of time, we've trained over 4,500 folks. And along the way, one of the things that, you know, I know that a lot of you have seen and, and, and a lot of you have experienced has been the training has been an evolution. As we have been um, working with Connect Carolina, as we've been learning uh, the system, as we've been adjusting um, business processes and along the way tweaking configurations, it, working with the system is an evolution, it's organic, and along the way the training as well has had to change and evolve to meet that. And um, we are continuing to offer a substantial amount of training. And um, if anybody um, has any training needs, you know, Anita's going to talk a little bit later about some of the training out there. And we encourage folks to continue to explore the training, op the, the many training opportunities that we have available. And then, real quickly, as everybody well knows, we talked about before October one uh, went live with Connect Carolina Finance and HCM Payroll, and um, just a couple of tweets that we wanted to highlight from that. Okay, and then r right after go live, oops, I hit the button. Sorry. Hit the wrong button. All right, we'll try the one above. <laughs> So um, the first 90 days after Go Live were extremely busy. Um, actually, we ran our first payroll before we even went live with campus. We ran the first biweekly payroll September 30th, and Go Live was October 1. So we were very busy getting all the new data in and being able to make sure that we were up and running. And what a great way to start is making sure that we can get people paid correctly. But we did. The payroll team did a great job, got everybody paid correctly, um, and we were off to a great start. Also, um, soon after we went live, we had to do with, deal with the new benefits enrollment. So we had to make some changes to the benefits plans and make sure that we could um, accommodate the new benefits plans in the Connect Carolina system. And um, probably one of everybody's favorite was the ARP. This was a really tough part for us because um, with the ARP, you know, we went live October 1. And we were giving salary increases. Remember, the ARP is the annual raise process for EPA employees. So we had to give salary increases back to July 1, which was before we went live. So um, we had to work on converted data. We had to go do retroactive transactions um, and kind of a, an account for the time period prior to go live. So it was very complicated. And we had a new system. And people were just learning. We had some bugs. 
Um, and so, you know, making funding changes was not easy. It was very difficult at this point in time. So this was a real stressor and something that was very hard to do right after Go Live. Um, we managed to, to do it. We had to do lump sum payments for the, you know, the, the days from July 1 to October 1. We got our salary increases in by December and we managed to make it through. I will say that was a very painful time period. I know that campus really struggled with that. Um, but we really appreciate everybody's effort to making sure that we got those increases in, and we did. Um, so thank you very much. And then um, kind of the end of our 90-day period was getting the W-2s issued and getting our tax forms in. And again, um, first time you do everything in Connect Carolina is a challenge. And um, we were able to get the W-2s issued, our tax forms in, and that was a big, big accomplishment for us. And kind of as we progress through the year, as everybody well knows that, you know, this was our first um, year-end closing in PeopleSoft, and I know everybody is uh, well aware of all the work and effort that had to go in to coordinate year-end closing, and, you know, we've had a successful year-end close and appreciate all the efforts that everybody in this room, everybody on the webinar and across campus have put in. Um, it definitely reflects the team effort and everything um, it being as independent it is, interdependent as it is. Um, definitely relies on the work and effort of everybody out there who are doing transactions and, um, and the like to close the year end. Um, obviously along the way, um, after we went live initially, you know, the first focus we go, getting people paid, getting payrolls, um, getting vendors paid, and then we spent, you know, a, lot, a substantial amount of time looking at financial reporting, looking at, um, um, you know, validating data, getting reports created, trying to get reports created for year end. And we, you know, you did that as a campus effort. We brought in a lot of representation from campus throughout the year to help us on those fronts and had some different committees and groups to help us on that effort. And then obviously the other area that has been, um, seen a lot of effort and, and has been, um, um, been a big um, area of work and support has been in the research area given the size of the enterprise, research enterprise. And I think it's important to kind of step back, you know, at the end of the year and kind of look at what we accomplished. Um, and I think you know, I want to start with that and say, you know, during the course of the year, we paid 327,819 paychecks, uh, processed 75,927 HR transactions, and as a lot of people in this room know, and a lot of people watching on the webinar, um, a substantial number of labor funding changes, uh, processed 34,757 departmental deposits, um, put in 68, little over 68,000 requisitions, um, issued 68,203 purchase orders, processed 304,684 campus vouchers, um, and processed 1,252 awards and 1,587 projects. So I think, you know, in the context, in that context or in that setting, we've accomplished a lot this year. Um, and again, as I said a little bit ago, all those accomplishments reflects all the work across campus that everybody put in to generate those numbers. But by the same token, as we said along the way, we recognize this has been, you know, as an exercise in change, it's been a substantial effort and it's taken a substantial um, amount of cooperation, a lot of patience, and a lot of hard work to get to where we are. The one thing I'd like to highlight is that as we look on um, central finance. When we first went live, um, it took us 37 days to close the month of um, the month of October. And as you can see, over time, uh, we whittled down the closing time frame to five days right before year end. So, yeah, I think that's a reflection or shows that you know over time, as we spent more time with the system, got used to it. Um, you know, things did. You know, in that particular area, got you know got easier, got better. And, you know, that's something that we expect to see across the board as everybody continues to get more and more used to the system and as we continue to work um, to, um, you know, kind of look at business processes, you know, work on reporting and the like. And then meanwhile, so all the, you know, for the last, you know, nine months or so, the focus has been on HR payroll and finance. and. Um, during this period of time, we did pass the uh, five-year mark that the student system has been in place and smoothly running, and so we wanted to note that as well. 
So as we talk about where we are today, I'm going to turn it over to Fran Dykstra, Assistant Vice Chancellor for uh, Enterprise Applications. Okay, so almost makes you exhausted to look at all the stuff that we've done over the course of the last year, doesn't it? Uh, but uh, the truth is that uh, although there are some things that are running pretty smoothly, there are still areas where we have opportunities to improve the functionality and how things work. And so there are a variety of things that we are working on now. And those include Pat. Yes, I'd like to introduce you to Pat. Pat is going to be the new payroll accounting adjustment tool. It will replace the short-term retro tool that uh, we've been using since last spring to process corrections to payroll charges in the system. Um, so the uh, thank God that the short-term retro tool was there because it provided an outlet and a way for us to be able to move charges off suspense and into the correct charging uh, instructions. Uh, but it was meant to be, it was built in a very short period of time, and it was meant to be only a short-term answer. So the team has been working on building a new, more robust, piece of functionality uh, to use to make these payroll accounting adjustments. Uh, we've had some people in from campus to help us with the testing. Anybody here in the room who participated in that? So no, looks like not. Uh, we are going to bring more people in from campus to do additional testing later this month and our target is to roll out this new tool uh, by the end of September. It builds some efficiencies into the system so that once you've entered 25 different funds to pay for one very ambitious research faculty member, uh, you can then copy those from one month to another so you don't have to re-enter all of that stuff by hand. So it's got some efficiencies like that built into it that we hope will help to make things easier for campus. So that's number one. Number two, following on its heels, we are working on improving the labor projections that are available for campus. Uh, we spend at this university somewhere around 65% of our dollars on the resources, faculty and staff resources, uh, that uh, help us with our teaching and research enterprises and public service enterprises. So it's very important for us to be able to make uh, projections and predict predictions about how those dollars are going to be spent. We have some labor projections available today, but those are not as robust nor quite as accurate as we would like them to be. For instance, they don't take into account job end dates. So, so we're uh, working to build new functionality that will allow those labor projections to be much more accurate and help you plan better your expenses over the course of the year, not just for state funds, but for uh, grant funds as well and trust funds as well. We're working in partnership with our colleagues at the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and the Office of Sponsored Research to examine how we've configured the system to manage uh, grants and contracts. So we know that this has been a pain point on campus, and uh, we're working to make sure that we can do two things. One is make sure that we're in compliance with our sponsors' intentions. So our sponsors have lots of regulations that we have to follow, and uh, we need to make sure that we're in compliance with those. The second thing is we want to provide as much flexibility to the campus as we possibly can uh, within those constraints so that, uh, so that people have an easier time in managing their expenditures on grant funds. So 
uh, working closely together to address those issues and come up with ideas and, and tactics for uh, improving that for campus. Finally, we've, uh, we're continuing to work on reporting. Uh, so we've made considerable strides in, uh, in, the mo in the recent past on reporting. Uh, used to be that you would come in the morning and you weren't really sure whether the, uh, the reports were going to be up to date or not. And uh, we've worked really hard to improve the infrastructure and monitor those jobs so that uh, we, our most recent metrics are out of 44 days we uh, came up with the data that was expected uh, 40 days out of that. And we're working hard to improve that too. And we're continuing to work on performance, which we know is, uh, continues to be uh, an issue for campus in some spots. All of that work and honestly hundreds of other smaller projects are underway to try to improve the way this system works for you. The truth of the matter is that although many of us hoped and expected that on October 1 we would be there, it would be done, it is true that what we've done instead is that we've created the foundation and that foundation enables us to build functionality to help this university improve in many ways. So. Uh, we're, we have to uh, understand that, uh, you know, Vicki talked about old systems that were uh, 46 years old, right? So over the course of time, we expect to use the foundation that we have established this past year to uh, build new functionality and provide uh, new capabilities for managing funds, for managing the people who work here and the resources available to them and for uh, helping our uh, students to succeed. So those are the kinds of things that we're working on as we move forward. Uh, so um, we're going to look at some of the ways we're moving forward uh, and I'm going to introduce Chris Derrickson who is our university registrar, registrar to talk about some of the things in student administration we're doing in student administration. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Derrickson, Assistant Provost, University Registrar. Um, Fran talked about you know hoping everyone was there on October 1st. Um, we went live with students five years ago. First registration was in April 2010, and we weren't there. Then um, we were crossing our fingers that the system would just stay up and actually continue to run while registration occurred. Um, the old system, called it SIS, the old green screens for those who used it, that was a fine system, um, but it had reached the, the limits of its capabilities. Um, PeopleSoft, while we've had bumps or Connect Carolina, while we have had some bumps over the last five years, have allowed us um, to introduce services. Um, to our students that we didn't have before. When I first started, ordering transcripts was a completely paper-driven process. So we'd have lines of students outside or filling the lobby of my office um, just waiting to turn in their paper forms, pay by check or cash or any other means um, for their transcripts. We also had a completely paper uh, grading process. So my first week on the job, I had the assistant registrar for records come and ask me or tell me that we'd run out of the three part uh, papers that we printed grade rosters on. And the most important decision I had to make was the third page is always Carolina blue, but we couldn't get that for two weeks, so I had to order one where the third page was pink, which we got the next day, but we got grades going. So with everything going on, the minute we went live with Connect Carolina, we had online grading. A couple of years later, we introduced an online grade change process that is completely automated and also completely auditable. Um, so those are all very important features for us. For the student experience, in the old system, they could register online, but the whole add drop process was completely paper-based. We now have a process where our students can drop classes online all the way through the eighth week. Um, 
even a couple of years ago, uh, academic advising would have lines of students out the door on the last day to drop classes. And we'd regularly get over a thousand paper forms in my office over the next couple of days um, requesting us to drop all those classes. Those lines don't exist anymore um, because students can do this stuff online. Um, we've made significant progress already, but we continue to look for ways that we can improve the student experience and also the overall data experience. One of the changes coming up, and this is a specific example of something we're working on, which is implementing an address checking software. So for um, when folks enter their addresses, it can make a big difference whether you spell out road or put RD. So this would allow us to um, have addresses con conform with U.S. postal standards which speeds up uh, delivery mail, increases accuracy, so forth and so on. We're looking at processes to um, improve accuracy of names as well. Um, we currently take about two months to get all the diplomas out after May ceremony, and that's been happening for years. And the main reason is accuracy of the student's name. And uh, Connect Carolina will provide the tools, some of the tools we'll introduce to actually validate um, and ensure accuracy of our students' names. Um, we've been working over the last couple of years looking at security, making sure that people have access to do their jobs, but no more access than they actually need. So the university for student records has to remain in compliance with FERPA, um, which is that we have to make sure that we are not granting too much access. We're granting folks the access that they need to do their jobs. Um, we imported an old security model from the old student information system, and we are in the process of completely overhauling that, which will allow my office to better respond when folks need access or if they find out that they don't have enough access. Um, we'll have a much cleaner model that will work well with the new request system through Infoport. Um, as folks probably are aware, we're moving more and more towards online and non-traditional programs. A couple we already have is uh, MBA at UNC and MPA at UNC. Um, those programs don't have traditional start dates. Um, in fact, MPA has five start dates, I believe, um, at, at irregular times during the year. Those types of programs are only going to grow over the coming years. And Connect Carolina provides us the flexibility and the tools to handle those type of non-traditional programs. So we've been having meetings over the last couple of weeks talking about how we can better support the very creative entrepreneurial type of programs that our schools and departments want to introduce for our students and for students out there um, who may not fit into a traditional um, resident-based program. And lastly is improving the student experience. Um, I talked a little bit about that, um, but we continue to look for ways that we can make registration, ordering of transcripts, um, the graduation process, tracking of degree requirements, all these things, how we can improve that. And Connect Carolina has really given us the tools and the opportunity to do things we would have never been able to do in the old system. So I already talked about students can order uh, transcripts online. They can also order an electronic transcript. So over the past year, we introduced the first electronic transcript for UNC, which would not have been possible without Connect Carolina. Um, in the next month, we're going to introduce a new um, scheduling tool for students. So instead of having to break out a spreadsheet and mark down where they can, you know, where classes will fit, we have an automated tool where they'll indicate the courses that they want to take press a button and it will show them every single possibility of courses that they could take. Um, I actually recognize how important that is. My daughter is coming here in the fall. Um, she wasn't too pleased with some of the tools that we were giving her at the time. Um, she's looking forward to that one. Again, a tool that would not have been possible under the old system. Um, this next year we're going to spend an enormous amount of time working on the degree audit system to improve accuracy and usability for students. Um, it's a very powerful tool. I look forward to working with ITS on how we can make that a much more student-friendly and also advisor-friendly tool so we can keep our students on track to graduate in four years um, and also um, have a better understanding of the types of courses that we need to offer to our students. Um, so all these opportunities have been made possible by Connect Carolina. So we have, over the five years, I started 
as registrar March 15th of 2010. Registration happened two weeks later, so I've been living Connect Carolina. Um, I've gone through the bumps, but I see the possibilities that this tool gives us that weren't possible under the old system. So as we look at the finance side and kind of what's ahead or where we want to go, um, one of the things or one of the areas that we want to focus in on are business processes. Um, you know, we had a legacy finance system that had been in place for 28 years. We had a payroll system that had been in place for 46 years. You know, as Chris mentioned just a little bit ago, you know, we've got a new system and we've got new opportunities, new capabilities. Um, and it gives us a good chance to kind of look at how we're doing business and how we can improve business processes to become, in, become more efficient and to make better use of the system. One of the things, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of one of my later points I was going to mention in terms of what we're doing within the finance and administration organization, um, we recently created a new department or new group under Tricia Hennessy who's sitting right over there. Uh, continuous improvement and business intelligence, where the big focus for that group will be looking at business, one of the big focuses will be looking at business processes, but also at internal reporting. Uh, with that, um, Trisha's group, she's in the process right now of hiring out in her group. Um, that will be, reporting will be a big part of what they do. Um, and we'll be looking at, you know, right now the big focus on the reporting side is continuing with data validation, um, continuing with, um, you know, looking at the reports that we're currently delivering and kind of fine tuning those. And we also want to start looking at stuff like um, some maybe on a monthly basis pushing out some delivered reports, reports that are generated centrally that we push out, you know, potentially to secured servers for schools. That may be one area. We also want to start looking at dashboards. And some of this stuff is down the road. And again, this is kind of to what Chris has said earlier about looking at where do we want to go with this. Uh, looking at dashboard and then down the road looking potentially at predictive analytics. Um, Chris mentioned this a little bit ago. I think Vicki may touch on this in her section as well. Security is a pervasive area. Um, you know, that we you know, have to continually be mindful of, continually focus on particularly in these days and times. And it's an area in particular on the reporting side that you know, we need to be mindful of because we need to make a balance between um, giving people access to the data they need to do their jobs, but at the same time protecting certain information that needs to be, remain confidential. The other area that we're going to be focused on as well, as well is looking um, you know, in areas where we need to be very mindful of compliance issues. For example, one of the areas that we're focused on over the next quarter is working on the system functionality for processing as, as cheatments, where basically unclaimed property or money that, you know, where we may have written the check to somebody and nobody ever cashes it and the money's been sitting there for years, that those monies revert back to the um, state treasurer under state statute. So, We've got to have provisions in place within the system or a way to process or handle those from a regulatory perspective. So things like that will definitely continue to be a focus as we continue to look forward, particularly as compliance becomes ever more complex and ever more of a focus. The other area all around this is, you know, we've talked about the system as being integrated. It's integrated, you know, among different functions, be it HR, finance, research, uh, student. Um, but also, too, I mean, it, you know, it, the system is, you know, it basically goes into the functional organizations, how we get our jobs done. It's, it's integrated with our business processes and how we're structured and how we're aligned. So we're taking this as an opportunity in the finance area to look at how we do business, not only the business processes side, but also our organization, how we're lined up to do business. And, you know, one of the areas that right now we've got uh, for the finance and accounting division, um, we've got a consultant in that's looking at the way we're organized, looking at our resources, and making sure that we are best positioned to be able to deliver uh, the finance and accounting needs for the institution, for the campus, for departments, schools, and other business units across campus. Uh, 
Okay, so what's next for HR payroll? Um, you'll notice that there's a common trend, a common theme here with what Brian said about what's going on in finance. We also are looking to streamline our business practices. Um, we have business analysts who work every payroll when payroll runs. Um, there can be problems whether a user had done something, maybe that wasn't correct or there was a bug. So we're constantly working with our um, HR business analysts to look at our processes and to work with campus on getting suggestions for how we could do things better. So we will continue to do that and refine our business processes. Um, some of the areas, you know, um, we got our students out for the Christmas, for the um, winter break last year and for the summer break this year and, you know, kind of getting those processes a little bit smoother. The expected job end date still is a little problematic for um, HR representatives sometimes, making sure that we terminate people on the right day in the system. Um, so just kind of working on those, the, those processes would be one that we would focus on. The ARP is coming up again, and we have a team of folks that are looking at the ARP. Certainly won't be as difficult as it was last year, because we don't have to deal with, you know, the whole going back three months and dealing with converted data and all that. But it is the first time in a new system, and I know people are used to um, the, the tool we had in EPA web, and, you know, things were really, we had a lot of bells and whistles back in our legacy systems, and we're obviously not there yet. Um, so we're looking at how can we improve it, how can we make sure that the ARP this year runs more smoothly, um, which since it's not just a couple months after go live, will help, but we're still continuing to refine that process and we'll continue to look at that process on an ongoing basis. Other processes, um, requesting affiliates is still kind of a constant process, um, person data, getting bio data in the system, the most effectively is another area that we'll be looking at. So there's a lot of, a lot of different things we'll be looking at, including just the usability of our GT forms. Um, making sure that we can get the forms tweaked so that they're as user-friendly as, as they can be. Another area is looking at workflow and security. Um, we tried really hard to simplify our workflow, and we actually made some significant progress between the way workflow worked in our old systems, HRIS and EPA Web. Um, so we were able to simplify it, believe it or not. It is still really complicated. Um, and we, we tried really hard to meet the demands of campus. They were very vocal on what they wanted for workflow. Um, and we said, well, we'll put it in this way and then we'll reassess, reevaluate. So I think we have some work that we can do going forward with workflow and trying to simplify and, stream, and streamline the workflow. Security is another area. Um, so we want to continue to look at security. Um, one of the areas, you know, the, the commitment accounting area in particular is where it is where HR and finance meets. And so that's very, very complicated. Um, we've got lots of people who want to see data that, um, from an HR perspective, we feel um, like we need to make sure that the data is protected and only the correct people see the right HR data. But some of that data is payroll data and things that finance people need to be able to see and account for. So how do we make that most available? Um, in a secure way to the right people. And so we've spent a lot of time, the HR folks and the finance folks, talking about the right level of security and how we can make that easier for folks because we know that's an area that we can improve in. Um, reporting and analytics, like Brian said, um, we're very excited. You know, one of the things that going to Connect Carolina has done for us is put us in a place now where we can start to look at reporting and actually doing analytical work. Um, before, we had EPA employees in one system, SPA employees in another system. Sometimes the fields didn't even match. So to try to pull data from two different systems and get them together and report on it and do any kind of analysis was very difficult and challenging. Um, and we didn't have the kind of reports that I really would have liked to have seen. So we're now poised where we have everybody in one system. Um, and so I'm very excited about the kind of things we can do for workforce planning, looking at the future, you know, what kind of employees do we have? What are the kind of employees that we need in the future? How is the world changing and evolving? And how is the workforce changing and evolving? And are we positioned to have the workforce that we need in the future? So those are the kind of things um, that we will be now in the position to be able to start getting into um, as we move forward down the road with Connect Carolina. And then just responding to regulatory changes. So there's all kinds of stuff happening. You know, we, we went through the Affordable Care Act. We're still uh, making some modifications to the system so that we can 
um, get the data that, or, or give out the data to federal reporting agencies that we need to for the Affordable Care Act. We have to um, report to them in January, kind of like how we have to report um, tax information to the government in January. We're going to have to give um, some ACA reports to the government. So that's one area. Um, we're looking at some potential FLSA changes that are going to be happening. So there's always just different things that we have to um, that have to cope and keep up um, the progress with in regard to regulatory changes. So that's another area we have to keep our eye on. And then just expanding employee self-service. So, um, you know, we were able to, for the first time, have managers actually get into InfoPort and enter performance management um, ratings for their employees. Uh, that was something kind of new and different. We haven't done that before. Another regulatory change that um, is, is potentially coming down the pike are some changes to the performance management system. It won't be such a big deal for Carolina because ours our performance management system is pretty aligned to where the state's going to be making some changes, but that is something, so we may have to tweak a couple little things going forward. Um, so expanding employee self-service, um, talking about online W-2s potentially next year, looking at some of the, you know, the tax, the tax forms that we could do online. So we'd really like to be able to push out um, some of the Commit Carolina functionality to actual employees. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Robin Sear. The Associate Vice Chancellor for Research. Hi. I'm here to talk about the OSR transformation project. And just like everyone who's spoken before me, we too are taking a deep dive right now and looking at OSR, how we do things, how we interact with the campus and um, provide effective stewardship of the funds that are entrusted to us by our sponsors. So the first thing that we're doing is we're trying to stabilize our operations. We've now come to realize that we need to develop some new metrics and some new management reports so that we can be more effective in making sure that we're balanced and poised to do the workflow that's coming at us. So we're developing metrics to help our staff more effectively manage their own individual workflows. And we're looking at developing new management reports so we can see what's coming at us in the future. We need to have a better handle on the volume of invoices and financial status reports that are coming at us so that we can make sure that we have our staff properly aligned to be able to be responsive to those reporting needs. We're addressing our, our transactional backlog. So we know that, like many others across campus, we've had some learning curves and some things that we needed to adjust to. So we are looking at our transactional backlog for award setup, for invoicing our sponsors, and for completing interim and financial, final financial reports. And the last thing that we're going to be looking at in the coming months is transforming our operations. So we're going to be taking a deep dive into looking at our business processes. How can we look for different areas for efficiency gains? What can we do a little differently? We've reached out to a large center in the School of Medicine that has agreed to work with us and look at how we exchange information back and forth. We're working with a department in the college. Hopefully, they're going to sign on to do this process with us so that we can really look at how do we exchange information back and forth between OSR and campus. Are there places where we can gain some efficiencies? We're looking at redefining our organization. How are we structured? How are we leveraging the talent that we have? And what areas might we need to recruit and bring in some additional talent to help augment the staff that we already have and to help us go forward while we're mitigating risk, making sure that our sponsors and our collaborating institutions see that we take our stewardship very seriously and that we're not only effectively stewarding their funds, but we're doing so in a timely and compliant manner. You know, every time finance and HR and sponsored projects say they're going to make improvements, that means more work for ITS. 
because these days very few improvements aren't uh, at least assisted by uh, information technology tools. Um, so uh, we have, in addition to partnering with finance and human resources, payroll, and sponsored research, we have some particular things that we're working on uh, to uh, try to establish a good sound uh, foundation of technology. So the first area is security. And so you've heard uh, Vicki and Brian talk about security, and really what they're talking about is the security of access to information. But uh, in ITS, we have a slightly different uh, tack on security. Uh, we are trying to secure our information from outside attack. Um, anybody guess how many attacks uh, the, this university faces every day? Huh? Uh, what do we think? About 22 million? Right. Okay. Okay. So, so these people are not nice people. <laughs> and somebody needs to protect. I mean, honestly, in the last several weeks, we have found uh, we have found hackers from China and Europe on our doorsteps and prevented them from getting into our systems. So we need to continue to be very vigilant and explore the new vulnerabilities that uh, hackers are identifying and uh, close those gates tight while still allowing students and staff and faculty access to the system and the, the parts of the system that they need to look at their paycheck, or do their work, right? So lots to be done there to protect our environment. Another area is mobile platforms. Okay, so I can see that people in this audience at this moment are using the little computers that they have in their hands to check emails or do work. You walk across campus, and what do you see? Are the students, like, looking around? No, they aren't. They're all looking down at their smartphones. That's what they're doing. So we need to be able to provide capabilities in this new plat mobile platform. I'm happy to tell you that we started the first of that uh, late, uh, you know, I think in June and uh, have now capabilities for students uh, to uh, see the information from Connect Carolina on their, uh, on their smartphones. So when these students start appearing on campus and on the first day of classes, what is that, August 18th, first day of classes, they're walking around like this, some of them are going to be looking at, where's my class, right? So they're going to be able to access that information that was once only available on laptops or computers in their handheld device. We need to provide that capability for more functionality uh, that we have here at this university because this is the new uh, this is the new computer of choice is the little thing you hold in your hand. Um, we need to continue to work on improving the reporting infrastructure. So we need to be able to marry all kinds of information together about how many students are in a class and how many teaching assistants it takes to support that class and uh, when the class is being held and how much revenue that generates. All of those things, we need to be able to answer the questions of the leadership in this institution about, uh, about uh, how they can best plan for the future of this uh, great institution. And we need to turn off the old legacy system. So 
I suppose there are people here that when they get a new car, just park the old car in the side of the yard just in case they need to have it available. Uh, but uh, honestly, I have some relatives that do that too. Um, but most of us can't really afford to do that. <laughs> most of us really can't afford to do that. And it's all the more important for us here because we have uh, commitments to retain data uh, for, for records retention requirements by the state and federal government. So if that data is on a platform or a computer that we have no support for from our vendors and for which the people who knew how to run it have retired, the likelihood of us being able to retrieve that data when it's needed grows dimmer and dimmer every day it sits on that old platform. So we are working hard to ensure that we understand what data needs to be retained and we can move it to platforms where it will be available should we need to produce it or answer questions about it. Uh, so we're working hard to, uh, to um, decommission those old legacy systems uh, so, and protect that data. So that's another effort we're working on right now. Um, so we're going to be working together with you to achieve all the things that we've talked about from finance, OSR, HR, and ITS. And Anita Collins is going to talk to us about some of the ways we're going to do that. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, how many of you are feeling kind of like this right now? This is my our symbol for a little bit of information overload, maybe. Um, so connect, especially on the HR and finance side, I think um, a lot of information has been coming out to you guys. and. Um, the reason is, of course, that the system is still a very dynamic system at this point. Lots of changes coming. So um, we did thousands and thousands of test cases before we went live. But the true test always is when you go live, and that's when you guys figure out changes that are needed or bugs that need to be fixed, enhancements that need to be made. And so we want to get those changes out as quickly as possible. And what happens is there's a lot of change, a lot of information um, coming out, and you know, it's some it's just it's challenging to keep up. So I want to talk a little bit today about some channels available to you, ways that you can get information, kind of cut through the information overload. And I also want to talk a little bit about how you can get us information. And I'm hoping a lot of you in the room are already doing this, but I just want to kind of um, make clear that these channels are available because it's our system, so we want to make it as um, great as we can make it. And the best way to do that is to know what you need, what's missing, make sure that um, we're meeting your needs. So let's um, run through those resources that are available. So the first one, I know if you've ever been to a presentation that I've done, I've mentioned this website at least seven times, but I've got to do it again. I'm compelled. Um, so the ccinfo.unc.edu website, how many of you guys have been out to that website? Great. Okay, pretty good percentage. That's great. I'd like to see every hand go up at the next um, time you guys come see me. But um, it is just the resource that if you don't remember anything else, remember this one because everything else I'm going to tell you, you can find on this website. So we try to make it a central place that you can go to find training materials when we offer in classes. Um, you know, who, who can I contact with problems? How can I give feedback? It's, it's all here. Um, also, um, we have built-in help. It's custom help in Connect Carolina. So for right now, it's just specific to HR, payroll, and finance. But it is within Connect Carolina. You can also get it on the CC Info website. But um, there's a help link in Connect Carolina. How many of you have found this help link and gone out to the website? And yeah, not so many. So we're, we're trying to pump it a little bit more. But if you've been to a training class and you got a training guide, those materials are in this help system. Lots of other materials that we haven't um, maybe taught in class, but additional reference materials. So there's a help link in Connect Carolina. So I'll show you that in just a sec. So I um, want to point out just a couple of pages on the CC Info website that everybody needs to know about. And one is the resources 
um, page. So if you go on the CC Info website, click training, and then resource documents, um, it gives you all the training materials that we sent out. So information overload, you know, all these documents are coming at you. You don't have to worry about it. They're all here. And um, we just reorganized this page to try to make it a little easier because there was so much content out there. So hope you guys will check that out. Um, all the different documents that we are done, we've done are out on the resources page on CC Info. Okay, another useful thing is the training schedule. So I know, you know, to get access to Connect Carolina, most of you had to take training in some form, either computer-based training or classroom training. Um, but you are very welcome to come to classes again if you already have access, if you feel like you need a refresher, if things have changed and you just kind of want to make sure you're getting the latest story, you are very welcome. Um, and you can find that out again on the CC Info website on the training page and there's a training schedule there and, it, and we publish out um, all the classes that are available, new ones and existing ones. So, so come on out, we hope to see you in class. All right, and I mentioned the um, online help, so just to kind of hammer that home a little bit, the help link, it's not actually on the home page, which is a little unusual, but um, there, there you go, but at pretty much every other page, if you click the help link, um, what will happen is it pops up this help window, and there you see all the training materials. You can um, type the keyword and search for a particular word. If you want to search for voucher or um, EPAR or what, whatever you want to search for, you can find it out there. So um, when you get back to your desk, get back in the system, um, look for the help link and just give it, a, give it a try. So sometimes it's a little easier than finding the training guide or the PDF of a document. All right. So other things, I know um, many of you, most of you sh um, should be getting the digest emails. They used to be daily. Um, now they're roughly once a week. Um, there's one for finance and one for HR payroll. So those emails are coming out. If you don't get them or if you um, don't have them anymore and want to refer back, guess where they are? CC info. There, you can get to them there. Um, the user group meeting. So how many of you have come out to one of our HR or finance user group meetings? Okay. Great. Good. Great show of hands. Good. Um, uh, highly, highly encourage you to come out to the user group meetings and also let us know what topics you'd like to see. Okay. We try to listen for what the hot topics are of the moment and build those meetings around that. They're also available as web recorded webinars. Okay. And then the monthly update vid videos. Um, we actually had more than 3,000 views of the first one, which I think is awesome, but um, these are little two-minute videos that come out about once a month, I think, once a month, um, and just give you a super, super high-level snapshot on, on kind of key issues and things that are going on. Um, and then also the Connect Carolina newsletter and the reporting newsletter. So um, these you actually have to sign up for. So um, I think if you were in one of our working groups or um, a liaison, we may have actually signed you up. <laughs> but generally, you have to sign yourself up. We highly encourage you to do that. Um, you can go to the CC Info website. It's right there on the home page. Um, sign yourself up for those newsletters, and that, that way you'll be, always get the latest uh, news right in your inbox. Okay. So I know um, I love to dig around and I, I'm, I'm very much a go out to websites and learn things kind of um, person, but many of us also would rather just talk to a real person, right? Um, so as Vicki mentioned earlier, we have groups. Um, we used to call them training and implementation partners and then we kind of restructured the role a little bit um, because we realized that it was a really valuable role for us, it gave us a lot of really good input, and now we kind of have an ongoing role that we call a liaison. We have um, finance and HR payroll liaisons. So if you have a question about how things are done in your area, so maybe we're telling you kind of how Connect Carolina works, but you want to know how it works in your specific school or department, the liaison is a great place to go, a person to talk to. And again, you can find out who your liaisons are on the CC Info website. Another group of people that are just um, have been super important to us through the project are our MOU financial leads, and our HR officers. So MOU is a major organizational unit. Basically, it's a school or division level. Um, it's kind of the top financial or HR person within the school or division. 
um, again, a great person to um, talk to to find out um, how things are done specifically for you if you have a um, particular question that's how you guys particularly do it. Um, we're, these two groups are also um, sending out information where they're, um, one of their roles is to help us spread the word. So, okay, and then another group, so um, you may not want to reach out to the council directly, but they're really an important um, role. There's a, a set of councils for HR finance, um, for the student side, they've broken into sub-councils and things, but um, I wanted you guys to know about them because um, they're, they're kind of the strategy, um, they're, they make decisions about priorities, so all the features, everything that you guys, the requests that you put in, um, they get this, these, this is a group that prioritizes it, and it's made up of representatives from across campus, from all the um, schools and divisions, and they get all the requests that come in, and they look at them, and they prioritize them, and make sure that um, that they have enough information, and, and uh, kind of organize that work, and decide, you know, what the team works on. So I just wanted to know that, um, to be aware that um, those councils exist, and they're, again, a very, very important way that um, everybody doing the um, development work is working on the right things, and make sure that we uh, everyone knows what needs to be done in what order. All right, so I want to take this opportunity also to mention the user conference. So again, this is a convers you know, we want trying to keep a conversation between the people working on Connect Carolina and the people using Connect Carolina and the user conference we're really excited about. Um, it's in October. Um, it's, you'll be hearing lots more. It's just getting, the word is just starting to, we're just starting to put it together actually. Um, it's an opportunity for you to learn more about Connect Carolina. Um, it's an opportunity to just share. So um, again, um, we're really hoping that you guys, you know, if you want to present, at least attend, learn um, what others have to say, but not just um, taught by the project team, but taught by everyone on campus who is learning all the best ways to use the system. Um, and we're hoping it'll build a community because a lot of times you get the best answers from others who are doing the same thing as you are. Um, so, you know, this will be a way to learn who else is using the system, learn who else is doing what you're doing. So just throwing that out there. there. Keep an ear out for a word about the um, user conference coming in October. Okay. And just um, one other important thing is um, the help desk. So I know um, many of you know that you can call the help desk um, with a question, with a problem but it's also the place that you go to request a new report. So there's a, a new form in place for requesting a report and a process in place, um, which you can read about on CC Info. Um, and it's a how you request changes to Connect Carolina. Um, you can also call just to say, how do I do this? So this is just a central place for you to go. If you have questions, you want to um, submit a new feature, a request, um, you know, you can, um, Call the help desk. You can contact them online. It's the a best way to get in touch with us because every request gets a number and gets assigned and is tracked. And so rather than emailing somebody, if you go to the help desk, it'll be tracked in the system and it's a way for us to um, make sure that we don't lose track of anything that you have asked for or that you, questions or problems that you have submitted. So again, super important um, to know that you can contact the help desk for um, all kinds of Connect Carolina related questions or issues. Okay, so just to, in closing, I just want to say that it's, it's our system together, it's your system and ours, and so uh, we just want to keep hearing what um, you think, the questions that you have, any problems that you've noticed. Um, just stay in touch actively, try to, you know, keep up with the changes, be aware of what's happening with the system. It's a, it's a lot of information right now, but this is, you know, part of the process of making the system exactly what we um, need it to be. Okay, so at this point I'm going to turn it over to Vicki and Brian again for a few last words. So, since the last town hall, we have come a long way. Um, this change, I will say, was particularly hard. This change affected the way we all perform our jobs. You know, as adults, our identities are often tied to our jobs, and we like to be experts, 
And all of a sudden, on October 1st, we became novices at using our administrative system. And that really makes people feel anxious when they're trying to do their job the best they can, and they're really struggling trying to figure out how to do it. So we recognize that. Um, but it really was, this whole change was really something that was necessary for the university. We just couldn't continue on the path that we were on before. We needed to do something different. And our focus has really been on transforming the institution so that we're, we're in a place where we can remain competitive and we can prepare for the future. So um, we thank you very much for everything you've done to get us here. You all have worked really hard. I know there have been a lot of pain points. Um, we certainly understand that. We've tried um, the project team and the central offices and campus have all gotten together and worked really hard to try to make it through this time frame, to this time um, period. And we really appreciate all of your efforts and um, know, it, know it's been difficult. But the good thing is we've got Go Live behind us. We're functioning in the new system. Um, this is kind of a once in a career project for, for all of us, hopefully. <laughs> And um, we've got it behind us. We're in a good place where we can continue to try to just make things better and better for the future. So thank you very much. And at this point, we'll turn it over to you all if you have any questions. And we'll have, if anybody has a question, if you just want to raise your hand, we'll have somebody come around with a microphone. Something that I've been looking for, and I don't know, I request I don't know what the status is, the status of being able to check on how many hours someone got. I know it's coordination between Tim and Connect Carolina, if that's a possibility as far as an info report. report. Um, I'm going to turn, we have uh, Brian Simmett, who's the interim director for payroll services in the audience. I'm going to ask him to field that question. Oh, hold on. Is this being total hours or what? <laughs> 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 Remember, we've got 11 hours, so we really need you to speak into the microphone. So we have a. Thanks. We have temps and students, and some of the students have multiple positions on campus, and we can see how much they're getting paid. And Tim, we can see how many hours they work, but we can't check to make sure that we are paying for the hours they work for us. Okay, good question. Um, let me look into that and see what it is that we can do. So you just want to look, you just want to know what hours they've actually been paid by your department. You're not asking about the hours that perhaps they've worked for another department. Okay, we'll look into that. What is the advantage of PAT over the current retro tool, and would it also take into account the fringe benefits being moved and show us that dollar amount? Okay, can you hear me? All right, here's the, the benefits. Let's see. Number one, uh, have you used the short-term retro tool? Okay, so if you have used it, you know that if you're uh, moving time for a person who's taken vacation time and sick time and used holiday bonus and worked regular hours, you have to do each one of those separately. Uh, you won't have to do that in, the, in PAT. In PAT, uh, you will, will consider those all regular hours and then behind the scenes will allocate them to the correct earnings type. So that's one benefit. Benefit two is right now in the short-term retro tool, you have to do, you can put in the charging instructions and we know of faculty members who have 30 different funds paying them. So if you have to do that faculty members have moved something for January, you've got to enter all 30 funds. And then if you were doing the same thing for February, you would have to enter all 30 funds. And if you were doing the same thing for March, you would have to enter all 30 funds. And 
So what you can do now is you can say, okay, I like the, I set up January, um, and I want February to look just like January, so it will copy those over for you. So I think that will be an advantage as well. The third thing is rather than those that they will actually be, the short-term retro does this too, uh, but uh, the tool you were using before that only posted those when a payroll was run. So these changes will be posted the night that they are fully completed. We've streamlined uh, workflow a little bit. So that's so. Those are some of the advantages. And what was part two of your question? Well, the fringe benefits. We'll show you that dollar amount going over as well. Uh, so what it's going to do is it's going to uh, show you the earnings, and we will calculate the fringe benefits in the background and send them over. Uh, but when you look at your report, you will be able to see that what went for earnings and what went for fringe benefits and taxes. Another question unrelated to the PAT. Um, when will the billing part be pushed out to the departments for con clinical contracts and clinical trials? Um, I'm going to ask Tricia Hensley if she could maybe help us with that one. I'm sorry, I was playing on my mobile device. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> <laughs> he wants. He wants to know when they're going to push the billing functionality out to the departments. Billing as in medical, on the medical side or? Medical contracts medical. and clinical trials. Um, that's a question as to prioritization. Um, we've kind of sat and met with HR and IT and finance and we're prioritizing the needs and the projects to go forward this year. Um, so we have not finalized that list yet, um, but we know people have been asking to, to look at many different mo mo modules through Connect Carolina and look at customizations and delivered functionality. So we're in the mode right now of prioritizing what this next year is going to look like for everybody and the resources that are needed to be designated to those. So we'll probably at some point, we, in a couple of places, council and stakeholders have vetted what we think those priorities might be, but we're not ready to commit and confirm with campus yet what those priorities are, but that'll be coming soon. I will say like the overarching priorities, I mean, not getting into specific ones or details. I mean, as you look on the finance side, in general, our commitment accounting, contracts and grants, reporting, security, and compliance. Can, can I ask a question to your question? <laughs> um, are you, are you, um, Specifically, are you talking about for clinical trials, how the departments may have to invoice for those and the conversation that um, the conversations that have been happening about booking that in the system so that you can follow the AR? Okay. Clarified your question. I don't have the answer to your question. <laughs> I don't have the answer right now. I know that has been on the table and I know there have been conversations about it. Um, I think we can get with Amy Johns and, and Patsy Oliver, and we'll, we'll follow back up with that, because I know that was one of the intended uses, one of the benefits that we were looking to get out of the system so that we could track the accounts receivable and know how much we have outstanding and, and be able to know what revenue we may or may not be getting. Um, so that is still a conversation, but I, I can't give an update on where we are with it. But we should know by 3 p.m. today, right? I'm sorry? We should know by 3 p.m. today, right? Um, no. <laughs> right. So I'll just add to that real quick. Um, th there are conversations, as Vanessa said, um, these are wrapped up somewhat in conversations around uh, clinical research management system in general. Um, there will be an announcement coming out about this shortly, but there is, it's highly likely we're going to be investing in a commercial off-the-shelf platform to manage our clinical research. and. When that comes, we will be changing a lot of processes. Billing is one of the things that's under consideration right now. But to be honest, there are a lot of discussions that need to be held around that to figure out exactly how that process should work. Um, I think everyone would agree we'd 
be best served to, to really plan that out well before we start making changes. So um, that's going to proceed over the rest of this calendar year, probably into the fall. We're going to really get deeper into those discussions to figure out how that should work, both in the new commercial system, but also how that interacts with Connect Carolina. So no answer by 3 p.m. <laughs> Can I just offer a follow-up on the question regarding the number of hours that the individual is being paid for? So on the check register, you can see the dollar amount. What you would like to see in addition to that is the number of hours, correct? Okay. I'll talk to Scott about that. We actually have a question, a couple of questions uh, that have come in from the webinar. Um, and one is very similar, I think. It says, when will a payroll check register and funding distribution report be available for each pay period that provides a simpler summary presentation like the pre-PeopleSoft system offered. Coming soon. <laughs> Coming soon is the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. And we're very close. In, oh, sorry. Um, there's a payroll check register that, if not by Friday, next Friday, within the next week or two, um, will be delivered out to campus. Um, that might not be what everybody is comparing to the old two FRS um, payroll check register reports, but um, that will be close to or very similar to what we used to have. And then the funding um, report, we know we, it was out there, we took it down due to resource issues and working on PAT and a long-term projection tool. We've had to delay moving forward on the funding report. We know every day we're, I'm getting, Scott's getting requests, when is that coming back? But again, it comes down to resources and priorities. Um, and the PAT tool is very important for ARP, which is coming out. So we're trying, again, to prioritize and use our resources the best way we can. So we hear you. We know that the funding report is very important, and we're not forgetting about it. But um, again, I hate to say coming soon, but it's, it's next on the list. OK, here's another. Uh, an enhancement that has been requested but not yet provided is to add header information to Infoport reports and screen prints, such as employee name and PID, on the employee profile, screen print, and source slash program, code slash project name, PI, date range. It's a very, very long question. Uh, let's see. Having this information included would be such a huge convenience to users, and it doesn't seem like it ought to be too difficult to provide. So uh, the best thing to do is submit a help ticket on that and say this is a critically needed report or an enhancement to the report, and we'll work through the council and get that pushed through. I think it's important to note on that. Um, so you know, I know maybe in isolation that might by itself seem like something small, but kind of when you kind of roll all these things up into a big ball and everything going on at one time, you know, pri is, is going back to what Trish said a little bit ago. Prioritization is is key. I mean, we. And, you know, we want to try to, we want to make things as um, seamless as possible. We want to help you as much as possible, but we also, we've got to be realistic and prioritize. And that's where I think mentioned earlier, I think is Anita who mentioned on um, one of her slides about the different councils. So on the finance side, we've got a business process reporting and finance technology subcommittee, which one of its charges or tasks is to prioritize functionality and also to prioritize reporting. So to Scott's point, to get things in a queue, you can put that on a remedy ticket and send it in. Um, those items are kept, they're tracked, and then through that council, we do prioritize reporting needs and um, functionality requests. And the same thing happens on the HR, HR side as well. I have one I hope that can be answered quickly. Has June officially closed yet? Um, we have pretty much, at least in as far as internally is concerned, uh, closed it, uh, closed the month of June, and we have opened up um, July, or I'm sorry, we've opened up for August, actually. But with everybody being aware this is fiscal year end, um, it takes a little bit longer because we have to, at the end of the year, we have to um, take our carry forward request to the state, get them to review and approve it. And so that typically, even in a legacy year, would slow things down. So we're in the process of reconciling with the state before, and before we can say we officially closed, the reconciliation has to close out with the state. So 
Internally, we're closed for the month of June, officially, at least with respect to the state. We're not quite yet, but that's kind of normal process. Okay, real-time update, we're good. <laughs> Thanks, David. Any other questions in the room? Okay, with that, um, we'd like to thank you very much for coming. And if you do think of other questions as you get back to your desk, feel free to send an email to any of the presenters today or um, log on to CC Info, and you can submit um, questions there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.